Ah, the topic of the day is catalysts, and in this little video clip all I want to do is go over a bunch of examples of catalysts. Uh, I have no calculations actually. Perhaps in a more advanced class you can do a calculation. But the action of a catalyst, or in your body, an enzyme, in a living organism, an enzyme, um, is relatively simple on the surface of it. Well, that's not a pun, because, well, you'll see later why. On the surface it's pretty simple. Uh, it, a catalyst lowers an activation energy and therefore speeds up a chemical reaction or provides an alternate pathway to speed it up, but is not used up itself. Oftentimes we'll use energy level diagrams from higher to lower, and uh, this is a big activation energy right here that these reactants may not be able to get up over naturally unless we provide some kind of shortcut, catalyzed pathway, and you'll see lots of these uh, energy level diagrams as in parts of questions and such. Sometimes the bumpiness is even a little bit more intricate, confusing, involved. Sometimes there's a couple of bumps, but in any case, let's look at some more of those. Uh, sometimes we'll, so we'll read the thing from left to right. So these are the reactants, and we have a big activation energy barrier, and these are the products down here, low. Although we can certainly turn things around and say, let's call these the reactants, and let's get aboard this big activation energy for the reverse reaction. I guess it would be uh, this one plus this one. The difference between um, reactants here and products down here is called the delta E, or the delta H of reaction. Well, no, delta H, let's call it delta E or um, delta G, the change in free energy. I'm not sure if your class has defined free energy yet, but it's like an energy. A little more to it than that. So catalysts, um, let's see, here's one for hydrogen peroxide decomposing. Um, oh yeah, hydrogen peroxide decomposing. You can do, you can do it with uh, iron chloride, you can do it with potassium iodide, you can do it with potassium permanganate. Uh, you can do it with any, like carrots or anything, actually almost anything has enzymes that will decompose this H2O2 your skin does when you pour hydrogen peroxide in a cut and it bubbles and stings and creates oxygen gas and water and that bubbling action not only helps physically clean out the cut but also this is an oxidizing agent so it oxidizes the germs in the cut. Um, homogeneous catalysts are catalysts that are in the same phase as the reactant. So if I had some iron chloride aqueous or some potassium iodide aqueous along with this H2O2 aqueous, in a sense we don't say that potassium iodide or the iron chloride, uh, they do actually partake in the reaction, but they're not consumed, they're reproduced, they're, they're used and then made up again. Hard to imagine. Uh, heterogeneous uh, catalysis is where we have maybe one phase, solid liquid gas aqueous, and a different phase, this is solid manganese dioxide as a solid catalyst, so it's a different phase than that one. I'll probably show you some of these in lecture as demonstrations for sure. Uh, another example, um, vanadium oxide acts as a catalyst, or platinum and nickel and palladium often act as catalysts. Um, Sulfuric acid preparation, now that's the first step in sulfuric acid preparation. Don't remember any of these examples. Just look at them, think about them. So I guess the conclusion would be here, we sometimes write the catalyst over the arrow, or sometimes we'll write CAT, or catalyst, above or below the arrow, to say we're using a catalyst to help this reaction go along. Whereas without the catalyst, it would just take forever. And we can't afford to wait around that long. <clears throat> Excuse me. This iodide ion is a catalyst, and this is a different way to write a previous reaction that I already had up there. But it decomposes the, helps the H2O2 decompose into hydrogen, I'm sorry, water and oxygen gas. Um, sometimes we'll see um, other things written over the arrow. This is the delta, the triangle means heat or energy. So if I add heat or energy to hydrogen and oxygen gas, kaboom, they react to make water. But I can also add a palladium catalyst to that same mixture of hydrogen and oxygen and it'll also go kaboom to make water with no addition of a spark or a flame. I'll show you that in class if I haven't already. Um, sometimes it's called delta G, sometimes it's called delta delta E. You might even see a delta H but more more generally it's the change in energy or the change of free energy from the product, I'm sorry, reactants to the products and uh, 
This is the catalyzed pathway with uh, palladium on carbon. The carbon's not really the catalyst to help support the palladium. The palladium is actually in very small quantities and in solid powder, and these gases sort of collide with it and land on the palladium. And the palladium has some kind of funky way to help weaken the bonds of the hydrogen and or oxygen, make them both more reactive, and that creates a little bit of the uh, reaction that's exothermic, and that drives further reactions. Whoa, that's confusing. Well, anyways, this is a step-by-step-by-step-by-step-by-step -by -step -by -step -by -step story of how you can take um, a catalyst in a different phase. Sorry, this picture's kind of blurry. This picture looks like it has... What is the catalyst here? Gosh, it doesn't even say. How annoying. Anyways, there's a perhaps a palladium surface here or some kind of metal surface that allows these bonds between the CO or the O2 to weaken. And then when some other molecules come in and collide, we see some some breaking of old bonds and forming of new bonds. I have a better picture. Something like that. A little bit later. You know, in biochemistry, enzymes, enzymes and catal catalysts in your body are complicated, super complicated collections of proteins that have funky shapes and do funky jobs. We call them enzymes, and there's there are some commonalities, but also there are so many different kinds of enzymes that do different jobs. Sometimes the intermediate, the in-between, is called the um, enzyme substrate complex. So this path from here to here, from reactant to product, is kind of complicated with um, one activated complex falls down to an enzyme substrate uh, intermediate and that then breaks over this barrier to become the enzyme product and then the product dissociates from the enzyme and the enzyme goes on to do more catalysis but in any case interesting maybe someday you'll be so motivated or lucky to have a more advanced class in catalysis or Action of in, uh, actions of enzymes. Uh, this one, the o ozone O3, it reacts with an oxygen atom to make two O2 molecules. Very, very, very slow. Looks like this one, though, is going to be catalyzed by a chlorine atom. A chlorine atom appears in the beginning as a reactant and in the end as a product. And in, in a sense, when you add these two together, in the case of a mechanism, I take this one plus this one, this chlorine atom cancels with this chlorine atom. You may also notice that this chlorine monoxide molecule here is an intermediate in the first step and consumed as a reactant in the second step. So we could say the CLO molecule is a, an intermediate and it would cancel from my overall reaction. Hmm, more examples of catalysts. Not exciting. It's just uh, I wish I could blow up some octane or some react some carbon monoxide. This looks like a summary of some things we've already seen. In addition to being in your catalytic converter of your car, the catalytic co converter of your car is kind of expensive because it has platinum, sometimes palladium, very expensive metals, nickel oxide, to help clean up the emission from the unburned hydrocarbons and contaminants in the gasoline. Uh, gosh, we saw that already. What's it doing there again? Gosh, did we see that already too? This is a famous reaction with uh, nitrogen and hydrogen gas to make ammonia. But it wouldn't work very well without that catalyst. Um, yeah, our ozone layer in the uh, upper atmosphere is in danger because humans have been spewing out quite a bit of ozone as a pollutant produced during combustion of whatever. And that ozone makes it up into the... Um, uh, what's it called? The stratospheric ozone? I think that's what it's called. If the ozone makes it up into the upper atmosphere and and it could actually help protect us up there. Ozone down close to the ground, I think it's called tropospheric ozone. is not good for your health. You don't want to breathe it too much. But it certainly does help us out uh, in living here on the Earth because it blocks harmful ultraviolets and gamma rays from outer space. We found out that there's a catalyst for this reaction to take ozone and an oxygen atom into two oxygen molecules, which themselves are even more stable than the ozone. But the problem is, without the ozone in the upper atmosphere, then we're left with holes in the ozone, which let 
harmful UVs and gammas through. And that's no good if you're especially living over the South Pole or even in Australia. The hole in the ozone layer we discovered in the late 80s, I believe it was, um, it's gotten so bad that you definitely have to cover up or otherwise you'll get way too many ultraviolets and gamma rays from outer space. I think since then it's actually healed itself a little bit. Look at this one. Here, this CLO, the chlorine monoxide. I think I saw this reaction already. It's a reactant here and a product here, so it's used here but created here, and it cancels out my overall equation, a net equation. So it's a catalyst, and the chlorine atom and the chlorine atom here and here are intermediates. They are opposite. That one's produced here and used here again. They don't appear in the overall reaction either, but they're called intermediate, and this one's called a catalyst because it's in the beginning and the end. Yeah, this cycle of uh, chlorine catalysizing the decomposition of ozone is rather complicated. It has several steps. You can think about it as having several intermediates and several catalysts. Um, two of these are here, and oh goodness, they should cancel somewhere. I guess down here, that's not very well described, descript. CLO here, CLO here, BRO here, BRO here. I guess you could say this is a catalyst, CLO and the BRO, and the bromine monoxide, chlorine monoxide. Um, this bromine atom cancels this bromine atom, intermediate. This chlorine atom cancels this chlorine atom, intermediate. Mm. So eventually you get the hang of intermediates versus catalysts. Mm. I guess this is some kind of satellite imagery of how how bad the <coughs> excuse me how bad the whole in the ozone has become or had become at one point. Excuse me, you guys are wearing thin on your patience, yeah? It seems pretty dramatic when it's put in this color imagery like this. And indeed, there was a, another hole discovered in the northern, um, over the northern hemisphere, the North Pole. But since most industrialized and post-industrialized countries have uh, put severe limitations on the chlorofluorocarbons that were used in refrigerant gases, and this hole has begun to mend itself since then, I believe. It's amazing how the Earth can fix itself after we screw it up so many times. That's just my soapbox, forgive me. So again, heterogeneous, uh, homogeneous. Homogeneous means the uh, catalyst is in the same phase as the reactants, and heterogeneous means that the, rea the catalyst is in some other phase. So if I have the gases flowing across the catalytic converter in your car, and the catalytic converter is made of solid platinums and nickels and such. That's a heterogeneous catalyst. Here's a better picture of something I was talking about earlier. Um, the reactants and products are often in intimate contact with the um, called the solid phase of the catalyst and that in contact or momentarily bonding with or touching or sharing electrons can weaken some bonds and allow other bonds to form. Like for example if I was trying to hydrogenate this um, ethene with a double bond, uh, yeah, this hydrogen molecule can come in contact with the catalyst surface. That catalyst momentarily weakens the hydrogen-hydrogen bond, making it very reactive, and it's actually attracted to this um, the electrophile, I believe. Don't tell your organic chemistry prof. I'm um, weak, rusty on that. I think, yeah, yeah it's got to be. So this extra negativity attracts uh, positivity and that positivity of the hydrogen atom nucleophile. Yeah, yeah, did I see that right? So, yeah, I'm going to brush over it for now. Okay, interesting. And they uh, later come apart from the um, catalyst surface as things are always wiggling around with their constant random motions of uh, thermal or kinetic energy. Enzymes, just super complicated, uh, <laughs> complicated uh, structure, no, and it may even be a complicated kinetics or rates that uh, these um, reactions are going through. The enzyme sits in a site we call the active site on the sub. No, oh, I'm sorry, the substrate sits on what we call the active site of the enzyme, but curiously the substrate will often change the shape and size of the enzyme. So this is a oversimplified version, but indeed the enzyme with its active site helps the substrate 
in some cases break apart, in some cases come together, in some cases simply rearrange or change configuration. And they both change each other. So the enzyme changes the substrate and the substrate changes the enzyme. At least while the enzyme is docked to or bonded to, temporarily uh, hooked up with the enzyme, the enzyme will often change back into its original conformation or shape once the substrate is left or the products have left, I should say. Here's a model, a simple model of the su sucrose, sucrase, sucro sucrose, sucrase, I wonder if that should be sucralase, anyway, uh, this ase enzyme, enzymes often end with an ase, uh, the simple table sugar docks with this enzyme and the enzyme helps weaken that bond somehow and then they float off as two separate and smaller molecules. Oh, thanks for watching guys, it's a Friday afternoon for me, I think I'm going to go relax somehow in the sun. Have a good one, and we'll see you in class.